Guys, thanks for coming out. We're going to start out with George's words of wisdom or something like that. Um, give me 10 minutes. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming to the CCBA meeting. My name is George Dado. I'm president this year. Side conversation to be picked up. Please take side conversations to the hallway. And thanks for being here. And if they're juicy, I'll record them and post them up on YouTube. <laughs> uh, thanks to Donna and Lynn. Lynn, where's Lynn? You, Donna here. Lynn's outside. There are two vice presidents this year. I've turned over the meeting agendas and the meeting plan planning to them, which is a huge responsibility taken off my plate. For those of you who've ever organized and planned and ran a meeting, it's not easy. So many thanks to Donna and there's Lynn. Lynn, raise your hand. Lynn Arnold's our second vice president. So these meetings are not thankful. Thanks to me. They're thanks to Donna and Lynn. Um, and there's the agenda. They run a really tight agenda. And we want members to participate, right? So Donna is, and I'm going to be reaching out to people to, to participate. It, you don't want to hear from the same people. You don't want to hear from me. They give me 10 minutes. That's all I get. So please, if you have something to share or doing something interesting or, 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 or learn something yourself and you want to share it at a meeting or if you want to share it on Zoom, please let us know. Georgetown talk. Okay. So here's my talk as a president for 10 minutes. Everything the CCBA does needs volunteers, okay? I know you guys hear about this. We're all, we're all volunteers. This is our active season, right? There's a lot going on in the next couple of months that we're delivering to members. We need people to, to, to help. We need an assistant treasurer. You know, those, most of us know that Jack resigned as being treasurer. Howard stepped up to be primary treasurer, the first treasurer. But the job is more than one person job. So does anyone today... <laughs> you get a door prize. <laughs> you get your. You can go up to the thing and pick a prize if you raise your hand and say, "I'll be assistant treasurer." <laughs> Do I get a credit card? <laughs> can, can you tell us what's involved? What's involved, Howard? I think the main thing would be the members maintain the membership list because that's done through the website. And you can download transactions if he's a member and keep that all up to date. And some people also join the Pennsylvania State uh, Beekeeper Association that they, they need to be informed of who has joined or renewed. So it's not too bad. So there's there's two basic roles. That, this isn't counting my 10 minutes, by the way. Um, <laughs> there, there's the storefront and the sales, right, which is one part of the treasury rule. And then there's the membership management, which is keeping track of membership and dues and those kind of things. And also helping when Howard's not here. We really, it's a job that's too big for one person. Door prize, go, go, go to the table, go shake Howard's hand, introduce yourself. <laughs> oh, up, Howard knows me. We'll pick up a prize off the door prize. Your name is? Chris. Chris. Thank you, Chris. Please pick a door prize. Um, so we have our assistant treasurer thing uh, sorted out now. Um, that was easy. That was easy. Yes. We also need a newsletter editor. Like, I'll put the newsletter together. I need a second set of eyes to, to spot the typos. I vote yes, men. Oh, I'll do it. All right, yes. Will you? Yes. Oh, look at that. <laughs> okay, let's keep going, Chris. Hold on, yes. yes. I also need $100. <laughs> hey, Yasmin, pick a door prize. Pick a door prize. Pick a door prize. Thank you. Chris is our secretary. Uh, you met Howard. You met me, Lynn, and... And uh, Donna, the vice president, and Mark is, is VP Techno B. So uh, that's the crew who's doing your officer work. So thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you, Chris. Okay, April. We're trying to rebuild the apiaries this month. We had a lot of winter loss. A lot of us had a lot of winter loss. We're not very proud of having winter loss. I can tell you why, but that'll take it into my two minutes. We're trying to rebuild the apiaries. Uh, we're by, we're, we're try, you're going to hear, you know, the Queen team sent out and asked for frames. Uh, Hopefully we're going to get a bunch of frames of brood today. If we don't, uh, I may, we'll see what we get. I may do something again next weekend where the ass comes out to bring frames of brood to the apiary. We're just trying to rebuild it. Why are we trying to rebuild it? Uh, because we do a fair amount of education out there. The queen team does education. The apprentice program does education. We do hands-on education without bees. Uh, it's hard to do education. Yes, we are spending some of our money to replenish our bee stock, but we'd also like to, and we're also paying for the frames. If you bring a frame of brood, you're getting 10 or 15 bucks. So we're trying to use some of our assets to rebuild, but we need to rebuild and we need your help. So you're going to hear a little bit about the entertainment committee. Um, June honey harvest, that's on you. If any of us collect honey this year, it's been a relatively difficult 
winter and early spring, and July is the picnic. Next slide. I got a minute and a half. No, there's four things. I found an assistant treasurer editor, and we had a newsletter editor. It's like huge <laughs> today. Okay, four things. To keep, these are my four, four uh, general questions to keep your bees alive uh, that you have to answer after each inspection. The first is match the hive size to the colony size. This time of year is when the hives are expanding, right? The bees come out of winter at about 10,000 bees, so they cover about five to seven frames. And the bees are gonna peak at, at 60,000, 50 or 60,000 bees pretty much at the end of May. So between March and, and May, they five times the size of the colony. So knowing that you want to, in general, you wanna make your colony, but you wanna make your hive bigger, right? The peak nectar flow in this area starts around the end of April and goes to the middle of June is when the peak nectar flow is. So you wanna make sure you have your supers on at that point. Can you put too many supers on? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can, you can put way more size than you probably need, but you probably, this is the time of year where you wanna err on putting more size on your hive than it probably needs because the bees will fill up the space and once they fill up the space, they'll stop foraging. So in general, put space on your hives right now. If you start with package or, or, or nukes and you're a new beekeeper, uh, you may want to wait a little bit because they're just starting to build up versus an overwintered colony, you know. But again, put your supers on uh, last week of April, first week of May. Uh, queenless colony. Some hives are already swarming. You know, why are you putting more space on the colony to, to help it uh, enable it to get bigger and also give more space for the queen to lay? It's one of the things to do about swarm control. Um, so most healthy hives will swarm, right? So swarming is part of bees, it's part of nature. This is what they do. We're trying to prevent it as beekeepers. One of the ways we try to prevent it is give the colony more room to grow, right? If they have more room to grow, if they have space enough to put their nectar and their honey, they won't get found and they won't take off and swarm, okay? So you're always trying to prevent swarming. With that said, every beekeeper has swarms, almost, you know? Some people clip their queens and, and the swarm only gets three feet in front of their hive, <laughs> but it swarms. I'm not saying that's the way you should manage your swarms by clipping your queens, but you should think about a swarm box somewhere, right? So if, if, if you put a swarm box, it's just basically a new box, deep new box, hang it in a tree, put a hole in it, put some lemongrass oil in it, you may catch your own swarms, right? So the, at least you're giving the, the bees an option of where to go instead of in somebody's house or in somebody's room. So uh, think about uh, getting a new box hanging in, in a tree. Uh, recognize queenless colonies early. Uh, most of the time, queens will the queenless colony, especially this time of year, will requeen itself. That's part of swarming, right? The queen leaves, it requeens itself. That generally takes about three weeks to do. Uh, and, but sometimes it doesn't work right. Sometimes the colony, the queen doesn't come back from mating and it's still queenless. Feed when needed. Wow. Uh, it's been a it's been a terrible march, right? So we were talking to uh, one of my friends here to my right. I won't mention his name. Uh, you know, me myself included. We had colonies die or near die the last two weeks, right? They say they say you're really out of starvation. You're not out of starvation until the dandelions bloom, right? So if the dandelions aren't blooming in your yard, your colony is still at risk for starvation, right? Uh, and I knew this. And do you think all my colonies had feed on them? No, you know. And I had a few colonies that die or near death because they starve. Uh, I, I think we're out of that window right now, but it's a good thing to have in your mind that the weather can look beautiful in March, the bees know it, they start to brood up, and then you have what we had, two weeks, right? How many flight days in March did we have? Maybe eight, eight seven, eight <laughs> days. The whole month of March, they had eight days to forge. You know how that works. Not, you know, it, it, it doesn't work well, right? So they use up what's in their hive, and they have no flight days, and then they crash, you know? So it's just... We know this, and you're gonna eventually learn your beekeeping calendar if you do this enough, but knowing it and doing it are two separate things, right? Like we could say, we know it, but did I do it? No, you know, so uh, anyway, it was a, it, I think it was a tough March, honestly, or maybe a normal March. We've had, we've had really nice weather the last couple of years, right? I mean, March and April, they've been warm. The bees were, we were pulling supers in mid April. Now, now we're like, trying to get the bees to survive in early April. Anyway, so bees can start until the dandelions bloom. Feed when needed. If you have packages, if you have nukes, you can't overfeed them, honestly. 
Well, you can, but it's you're better off keeping the feed on new colonies than taking it off. So if you're not sure, give it space and continue to feed it a little bit. Again, that's an oversimplification, but that's what I'm here to do. Uh, know the mite count and treat effectively uh, is, the, is the last thing. We're not going to talk about mite counts yet. Uh, there, the mites are in the hives. The all mites are always in the hives, right? So you all, all the hives have mites. They're probably at a low level right now. You're probably okay, but come May and June, you got to start thinking mites. You got to start knowing what your mite counts are and treating effectively. So match colony size to hive size. Hive size to colony size. Recognize queenless. Feed when needed and know the mite count. Before, when you close a hive after an inspection, and you close up a hive, and I came to you and said. How's your, you should be able to answer these four questions. If you can't answer these four questions, you got to go back, go to your, go to rethink what piece of information did I not collect during my inspection that I need to answer these four questions. If you can answer these four questions, your colony is much more likely to live than my colony. <laughs> anyway, I took over 10 minutes. Uh, again, the club is here to, our, our primary purpose is to educate uh, this is just one way we educate through the meetings. We have our we have our Zoom on uh, beat chats on Friday nights. We have our events coming up. Uh, we have mentorship. We have apprentice program. We have lots of stuff going on. And the primary goal is making the best beekeeper that you can be. So thank you all for being here. And I'm going to turn it back to Donna. The CCBA has a Facebook page, and there was a guy who posted. He picked up some of um, Howard's uh, signs, and he made some really cool stuff. And I'm like, wow, that's really neat. I think I'll have him come out and talk to the group and show us some cool projects he's made. So I reached out to Greg, and Greg's got a couple of projects he's been working on. And I uh, brought more signs so you can make some. And we got more signs. <laughs> All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Greg. I'm not an uh, as experienced beekeeper. I've been beekeeping since 2021, kind of off and on COVID. So, um, but I come from engineering, so I'm an engineer by trade. So I kind of approach beekeeping from a different lens. I'm always looking for things to tweak or things to change. And whenever I see things out, I'm like, how can I use that for beekeeping? It's just, I guess we're in a board that thing. So maybe it's a thrifty aspect. I think all beekeepers are somewhat frugal in a manner. Um, we talked a little bit at the chat last night, all the prices are going up for us, right? So if you can see a couple of clocks here or there, uh, maybe that's going to help everybody out. So um, not paid by Howard, but I'm sure he has a whole uh, garage full of these signs. So I took a couple and I felt like, oh, what can I do with them? So I'll share a couple of these projects that I've done with them. Nothing here is exceptionally novel. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff I pick up are just kind of adaptations on either what I've seen online or what I've read somewhere. Um, just essentially different materials uh, that I've used that I found to be effective. So, so the signs come, they're actually good size, right? Because um, a full sign can be cut to fit on top of 10 frame, uh, 10 frame. Uh, so one of the other materials that I've used a lot in a lot of my projects is Reflectix. If people aren't familiar with this, it's essentially double bubble with a aluminum base on either side. Great for insulation, great for top covers or, or high or inner covers, I should say. Um, fits right on, gives a little bit of insulation, the reflective insulation quality. So I use a lot in a lot of projects. So, um, okay, so the first one I just want to talk through uh, is, so essentially an inner cover for a new, right? Um, again, repurposing uh, the sign, just cut that down, small inner frame, and then again, lined it with the reflectix inside. So great, super lightweight. Um, and a lot of times I didn't have that space on the top of my nuke. So put this on here, I put a hole in mine. I feared that I could as well. So um, found that to be a great use. And then with the reflexes, it gives a little insulation on top. So um, that a wood frame around the outside? Yeah, just a small, this is this is probably somewhere between three eighths and a half inch off top. Fits nicely, kind of. And then I have my Detroit cover fits right on top of that. So, um, so I've used that, um, expanded it over to this is the top cover for um, 10 frame. Again, the size is almost perfect. Again, using the Reflectix, fits right on top. I left a little gap on top as these frames or the hives are tilted forward. Gives a little bit of rain guard, so rain can roll off the top and then fall down. Again, this is just an aluminum face. Again, Dollar Store, one of my favorite stores for beekeeping. There's a lot of great products there you can repurpose. And then this is just aluminum like that. The duct tape that can be used as well. So, so you can just use aluminum foil on the top? This is a, yeah, like a heavy duty foil. Again, it's a dollar store just glued onto the top of, again, one of Howard's uh, uh, Sorry, political signs. It's floor plastic. It's just floor plastic, yep. But if I can get it for free from Howard, I'll take that instead of buying it. <laughs> um, 
Again, so I have kind of an integrated hot shim slash cover. So again, uh, you'll see the common thread here with the uh, Reflectix. So a shim with insulation on top, insulation, and then using the Reflectix. So this fits on top, cut a hole, use one of just the plastic, small plastic discs. Uh, this is what I overwinter all my hives in. It gives enough room for um, uh, for sugar bricks or fondant. Just stick it right on top of the hive, so that works out pretty well for me. So a couple of projects, relatively inexpensive. This is mostly scrap wood. You can see the you can see the purple on the side, right? So if anyone's gone to Home Depot, the seconds what they're trying to get rid of. It's a lot easier to find just small pieces uh, of wood. I cut those up, and then a couple of screws, staples. It does the job for me, at least on my inventory. So. Some projects from there, um, like I mentioned, uh, Dollar Store is kind of one of the places I go to a lot. I was trying to figure out some some queen uh, queen mating boxes. So as most people know, you can buy the, the packaged queen mating boxes, but they're like 25, 30 bucks. So this is my Dollar Store rendition. Uh, from the Dollar Store, you can get this foam cooler. Obviously, dollar twenty-five now. Sorry, um, this was again plastic cutting board from Dollar Store as well. So this is dollar as well. Um, reuse one of these plastic discs, but essentially, again, just some paper. Uh, this is a um, like a larger uh, tongue depressor or popsicle stick. Build those frames in here. Um, can't see inside, but there's a homemade queen excluder that was made out of again from the Dollar Store some of the bamboo skewers and um, <laughs> put a hole in the side. So two seasons, I was able to make queens with this. So again, you know, it requires a little bit of work to, to put one of these together, but- How many hours? Uh, Just time value is a exactly. space engineer. And then, <laughs> and then the qualifications that you've got to do that, right? Uh, but it's fun yeah. to think of it, right? You're getting paid in that time otherwise. <laughs> Yeah, okay. so, tips to the dollar store. Yeah. Exactly. So I don't know. I feel like we're always buying something there anyway. So throwing in a couple extra. Um, so again, kind of fun just to say, hey, you know, should this really cost 30 bucks to, to buy a commercial one, 25, 30 bucks, or you could make one and just throw it in the back to give it a shot. Um, so so that's that problem. Like Grave Dance double ended. Correct. Yep. So more than one? Two on each side. Yep, one on each side. And so I lay these sideways. I use different colored discs, so just to help in some of the queen navigation. How often do you go through that box being that size to worry about swarming or losing your queen or scenario? Pretty much every week I'll go through it. And so I'll put in there with a, yeah, so that's this side. Um, so when I use last year again, so some of these are more effective than others, but yeah, so essentially I throw a queen cell in here, cut out from one of my other uh, areas, throw two cups of bees, throw it in, Put it in the garage, sealed up for a couple days, then put it out. Um, see how much shed, open up the discs in the evening. Seems to it's worked twice already. So just <laughs> you know, something to do, something to repurpose. Uh, probably more engineered than it needs to be to do the purpose. But <laughs> I fuck doing it along the way. Um, another dollar store pur uh, purchase. So this is definitely from Dollar Store. What is it called? Lunch storage tower. Great, it just it struck me as, hey, this is a kind of a really cool configuration uh, with a lot less work. So it comes with two jars, a lid, and then, I don't know, this is like a dress on top or whatever. It's like, hey, that looks a lot like a real light tester. So I had, <laughs> I had a piece of, um, just a piece of screen. So essentially what I did, just cut through the two, essentially cut through the two middle pieces and just hot glued that uh, screen in there. Um, Again, this was a dollar plus a scrap piece of screen and a little bit of hot glue. Works really well, I used it all last year. The benefit of this is that um, while you're doing broats, if you have multiple hives, these are only a dollar, right? There's two things. You can line them all up, fill this up with your dog dish soap or your alcohol, whatever it is, fill these up and then come by and then do the actual test as well. Stick it in here, spin it around. These don't go through the screen and then you can count them up. So, it's kind of a cheaper solution to, you know, there's a couple of row of my checkers that are, you know, 10, 15, 20 bucks, but um, $1.25 was the right price for me at the time and kind of fun to just put something together. So those are a couple of projects. This is certainly uh, steel directly from Ed Sharp, but for those folks that are looking to clean off um, clean excluders uh, over the winter season. Um, Again, this was at Facebook Marketplace purchased. Though, if you, people notice this, this is a wallpaper remover. Oh, it was about the whole thing. It's like 
20 bucks off Facebook Marketplace. But what you can do, I use one of Carl Sign or Howard Signs again. Line up a couple nuke boxes, line up your queen excluders, hook this up to the um, wallpaper remover, and I just stick this on top of two bricks. Let this run one or two cycles. All the wax just melts straight down off of it, onto the bottom board. But again, a really kind of easy solution, like hands off. You just stick them in there, let it run. So definitely kudos to that sharp design, but just repurpose using one of Howard signs. So pretty pretty easy concept, and it does a great job at cleaning up. Greg, is that just giving off heat or steam? It's a steam. So it's, yeah, it's like a wallpaper remover. So normally that would plug into a basin that it just heats up the water. Unit that comes with it, it holds about a gallon and a half, two gallons of water, and it heats it up, and then the steam goes through the like tube. a professional steamer. Yeah, yeah you could yeah. use a I need a professional closed, steamer. That will work steamer. to clean my cleaners. <laughs> Apparently. <yeah. laughs> so, yeah, it works really well because there's just no hands on. You just set it up, kind of set it, forget it, and let it go from that perspective. Um, yeah, I guess just another random use for how this was just where I got my first nuke in. But of course, anyone who's ever dealt with plastic frames or, or plastic hives know that you leave your smoke around there for too long. You're going to go straight through. <laughs> again, using the chlor chlorpest again, a nice piece, just glued it right on top. So, um, you know, George is always talking about having a quiet box with you when you're doing your hive inspections. So this is what I use. And of course, something came up and I just laid my smoker down and then my smoker was right through the top of it into my quiet box. So um, a lot of uses overall uh, for that perspective. And this is the last one. This is what was um, presented um, on Facebook. Um, again, just looking for other solutions for bottom boards and things to somewhat potentially reduce uh, both robbing and try to reduce some of the beetle load. I'm certainly not a beetle expert as George is, but um, so what this solution is, just took a general frame, throw some, this is the, this is the, um, the eighth harbor clock. And then I had some, this is PEX tubing from a leftover project, but essentially, so this is screen, so nothing can get through here and just drilled seven holes and put in some of the, uh, the PEX. So two different designs here. So. It's my understanding that it's difficult for beetles to hover, unlike bees, they can hover, and so they can come up through this 90 degree and then walk right in. Whereas beetles are more of a kind of direct line. Now, I don't know, don't quote me on that, I'm not an expert uh, beetle person, but it's also difficult for the be beetles to come down and to turn this corner if they were trying to actually um, come in from the side of the hive body and then get in the hive of the raw. So I haven't specifically tried this, but the other option is by having smaller entrances, the bees might be better either to defend this. So during robbing season, certain tubes could be closed off or opened up. Um, the other benefit of this is just make a, a standard kind of uh, bottom board. What you can do is put with the uh, bottom board. Put this track of Put over the side. And then uh, again, reusing the chloroplast once again, cut a piece. I stacked up a little bit along the side and then just a zip tie here. What this essentially is, is just a, you know, it's a board. So this is kind of like the poor man's uh, screen board. Now this bottom, you can paint it white, but I like to do two options. Um, you can buy this in bulk. Essentially what this is, is fly paper. I put it around trees for spotted lantern flies, but it's sticky paper. Just run two kind of layers of that along the bottom. Anything that falls through the screen is going to stick here, so I can be able to get out. So that works really well for me, relatively inexpensive. The other thing I've done before, people are familiar with this, it's called Tangle Foot. Essentially, it's um, like a non toxic, just kind of, I don't know, sticky glue. You can very simply just wipe it on that bottom board. Anything falls in there, it's not getting out. So, particularly what I've done is put a layer on it right along this edge. So, if anything, again, tries to climb in, it can get through these holes in the chloroplast, but once it hits that layer, nothing's getting by there. So just a good indicator of seeing what's going on in your pod. There's anything overly special about any of these inventions, but um, probably more engineering time into it than actually necessary. <laughs> but it's fun to tinker around and just kind of try things out. So I'm more of a trial and error type. What size screen you have on that? This is so, uh, the, number eight? yeah, number eight. Oh, okay. yeah. So the Beatles will five fall through that? They, they can't they'll definitely they go sideways through or especially the larvae will come through they'll fall through that and then if they're trying to get out as they start coming out they'll hit either the entire mm -hmm. sticky paper or just that line that i put in there so i'm um, just a simple let's say adhesive you use the what the adhesive the glue for the 
Thank you. Oh, for, for that one? No, no, no. The, um, laminating with your plastic together. This I'm using, uh, it's Gorilla, Super Gorilla Glue. It's the waterproof version of that. Um, so I haven't had any problems with it. It's pretty durable. All your lids are pretty light. How do you secure them to your heart? Do you strap them? Do you put a weight on top? Uh, yeah, put a brick or stone. And I haven't had any blow up problems. Um, I, I had originally strapped all my hives down, and I don't know if it's just where I live, where the wind blows, but I haven't had any problems with hives coming up or top covers coming up. Like I said, one or two bricks on top of my. Um, Do you have any cameras on your hives? Are, just, are raccoons attracted to silver shiny objects? So I do have one of an uh, outdoor blink camera on my hive. I've never, well, I have a bunch of deer go by, so I have probably a million shots of the deer walking in front of it, but um, I've never had any other type of pests. Uh, yeah, raccoon skunks or anything. And I know there are skunks and groundhogs in the area um, underneath my shed. I think that's where the big threat is, but it's pretty common. But um, I don't know, any questions? It's kind of my approach to beekeeping, like I said, cursed with being an engineer and liking to tinker. So I end up with all these little projects that I use for, you know, half season, try something out. The club is out of mite washer, so can can I can I think about twisting your arm and maybe doing a evening to make a whole bunch of your mite testers, maybe? Yeah, like I said, the supplies are super uh, super inexpensive, so a good, good 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 project. Maybe. When you go to the dollar store, though, uh, it's like uh, hit or miss, right? Like if I went out there, would I find those things, or or they're not a standard? Yeah, so these are always standard at the beginning of the school year. I guess wow, they okay. figure everyone's going back to school and they need something else. So pretty much, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so August, September is when I usually, and it's great because it's it's watertight on both sides. So um, it works well. And then like I said, you just put that small piece of screen inside. Greg, you drill that or using your laser cutter? Uh, this one, this one I just did by hand with an exact device. But uh, yeah, anything would be able to, how do you cut this? Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. You just it. cut around it. Not a problem. And then you blow it. Hot glue it. Yeah. So that's you can see that's the yeah. That's the, this is the native one. Raise your hand if you own a mic tester. Own mic tester. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Raise your hand if you used a mic tester. Well, not actually. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I want to take an opportunity real quick to just kind of go back. How many new members do we have today? Where's Lynn? Where are you going, Lynn? Right here, I'm um, can I just, well, can you just tell us about yourself? Uh, my name's Mike. I've been at Geek since 2018. I draw my baby. <laughs> awesome. And Joe? Hi, I'm Joe. I live in Hamburg. Today's my gotcha day. My bees come tonight, so I'm very excited. And I um, hope this is a start of something great. Awesome. Well, welcome. And is Ben with you, or Ben, are you separate? I'm separate. separate? Uh, I knew that I got my nuke a week ago. They're not dead yet. <laughs> uh, this guy, Tom Breeze, works with my wife. He's been bugging us for a couple of years to get started. I don't know who's been hugging, bugging whom, but uh, yeah. Um, John? Yeah, John. So, yeah, I've, uh, I inherited some bees from uh, Joe Duffy, who has since passed away. He was a big uh, beekeeper in Montgomery County. And um, so far, I've killed about seven hives, but I still have one that we, oh, that Gordon and I have overwintered. So, awesome. and we're really? picking up a package at 11 o'clock today. And we caught a swarm. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's <laughs> swarming with an array home. It's going to be shortly. Awesome. And you guys are new? Be yeah, I'm Gordon, by the way. And nice to meet you, Gordon. John? Yeah. Where are you guys from? Uh, Burnside and Gordon's in Philadelphia. I'm sorry. I think he's speaking as well. Did you catch a swarm in Philly? Yeah. Did you really? We I had a cruise and asked us about 40 feet up, and we put a swarm trap up there and clock swarm. Mm -hmm. On one of the nice awesome. swarm days, we saw the scalpies a couple days, and then they came in. That was just this year? This year. This week? This week, yeah. <laughs> this week. Um, any new members on this side? I'm Ed, and um, brand new, green one, I guess you could say, and just basically the hobby for me to do with my wife. First time here? We've yeah. met your wife. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks, for yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming out. Thanks. Anyone else? No. My name's my name's <laughs> Ward. Uh, I've been a member for years, but this is the first time I've actually done it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yes, happy to be here. First month of meeting. Um, 
and keep these to cut out when called and um, yeah, that's about it. I'm, I'm just North Dakota, so. Me and Kristen, and we just got our nukes uh, Saturday. Last yeah, week. congrats. So awesome. We're They're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, great to have you. I'm Holly. Uh, same. I've been a member for a long time, but I'm um, just getting active again and getting my first uh, piece tomorrow. And uh, I live in Glenmore. Awesome. Well, welcome. Thanks for coming out, everybody. So for all of you new B members, we are uh, going to make you feel comfortable, but we're going to bring out probably one of our oldest members, not by age. But Howard, it is your grandfather that started this book, right? Yeah. And he's, he's working on a write-up for me. He hasn't done it yet, but he's working on a write-up about his grandfather for me to present. Um, but he's going to come up and tell us everything that he's done wrong recently. Oh, not me. Not me. <laughs> oh, not you. <laughs> My lungs are shot. I think too much smoke or smoke. <laughs> I never smoked in my life. I've been comfortable. So, you know, this means. so Howard the horrible beekeeper is not me. I'm Howard the mediocre beekeeper. <laughs> but my, this, this person I know, Howard the horrible beekeeper, has a story. <laughs> and I'm going to read the story. And you all have to be quiet and you have to listen carefully because of the quiz at the end of it. So no convincing in the middle. You'll spoil the fun and you'll get an automatic test. So listen for clues in this story. I was out at my apiary last week looking at my biggest, strongest hive. I found 12 cat queen cells, four cells on each of three frames. Since I want to expand, I found I had a 10 frame deep box and eight frames left. So I put two of the frames with queen cells into that box with my last eight frames. I had space next to my big hive, so I put the hive there, put on the keeper, and felt good about what I had done. So now I still had one more frame with queen cells. And I remembered that I had a hive with lots of bees and no eggs or larvae. So I took the frame of the queen cells and shook the bees off of it. Then in the smaller hive, I took out the edge frame, shook the few bees off of it, and replaced it with the queen cell frame. I put that empty frame that I took it off in a nice strong hive. Back with the inner covers and outer covers on both hives, and I went in for some well-deserved Nessie's quick chocolate milk. <laughs> So those of you that have had bees three years or less, did somebody tell me the mistake that Howard the horrible beekeeper made? It's, it's more than one mistake there, I know. <laughs> I don't want everybody to chime in at all the mistakes. Did anybody see any mistakes of what he did? You know who it is. Maybe it's too subtle. Maybe it's too subtle. Yeah, I think Nestle makes it quick. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes. He's yelling us, right? All right, well, there you go. Did you leave too many queen cells on? That would be one thing. In the new hive that I yeah. made, yeah. Maybe you probably want to just have a few, maybe <clears> two. <throat> so. Yeah. Did, did you shake, you shook off the nurse bees off of the hive? And you should have taken them with you? I'm uh, you, you were wrong about you the shaking. Queens. You had the wrong reason for the right answer. <laughs> you, don't shake the queen you don't shake the queen cells. You could destroy the queen that's inside the cell. You could harm her if you shake it. So that's that's good. Good enough. <laughs> Anything <laughs> else? Can I if nobody wants to, I'm yeah, fine with it. The queen cells went on the edge, did you say? On the end? And it should have been more towards the middle. Exactly. In the, in the hive that had just a had the bees but no queen. Yes. It's another one, Donna. It's another issue. It's another two issue. I'm lucky I got one. Come on now, give me some credit. <laughs> All right, let's open up to everybody since this is all flat. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't you move the queen cells with the hive right next to it. So yeah. they're likely to abscond and go back into the original hive. If you move the original queen, leave the queen cells in the strong colony. The bees that move with the queen will stick with the queen family. 
idealistically three miles. But if you've got one acre yard that's not three miles long, don't put it right next to the site, spread it to the furthest end of, of the acreage. Yeah. And also, I start telling answers, everybody else got you stuff. Did, you didn't put frames back in where you took them out. I didn't take frames, exactly. I kept that while in these space, but I put the frames in. I took the two frames out and put it into the new hive, no honey, probably. Um, so you did, if, if you are going to have the own apron, take a whole lot of extra bees in there because all the field bees are going to go back to original hot. So you want to make sure it's a punch. So should you? Feed them and kind of like lock them in there for a little while? Not, well, yes and no. You have to worry about moisture. So if you're going to lock some again, you want to put a wet sponge of water in there. You can do that for like a two day period and then let them back out again. But if you've got a new box and you're only transferring two frames, you're better off putting the bees into a new box rather than a 10 frame in there. Well, I guess that's And one big thing is he didn't check the hive <laughs> to see if there really was a queen there. They may have already sworn. Good chance yeah, they're all packed. There's a good chance they're already swarmed. Now you took all the queen cells out. Mm -hmm. Now they've got nothing. Mm -hmm. This was too subtle, but I never put a new inner cover on the new hive either. Mm -hmm. um, and that weak hive that had no brood, maybe they had swarmed. I didn't check for other queen cells. There were already queen cells in there. They all didn't swarm. Got a lot going on this year, Howard. <laughs> not many, not many. No, you keep saying I. So yeah, but you I, I, I didn't do this. Friend of the story. Sure. Yes, we are friends. That's pretty good. So that fun? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It happened yesterday to a friend. Also, yeah. now an hour. The yards of the you know, puzzle on Sunday night, the Sunday morning, the Will Shorts, and he would sometimes tell stories, and the, the, the competitor would have to pick up the mistake as he said. That. So I kind of got that. Oh, that was cool. Great job, Howard. Welcome and thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me down here. So, I was told I have 15 or 20 minutes. Sometimes I play a video and we talk about, we're gonna skip the video. I'm gonna promote the hog half home. Uh, and somewhere up here, he's gonna have QR codes where you could look at my split at your own time if you care to look at it. Uh, my website has things on it. so. We won't just talk about honeycomb. I have to talk about these books that are favorites of mine. I used to do a lot of presentations promoting this system. And then COVID happened and all that went away for a while. And in that same time frame, I realized I've been keeping these for 50 years. Oh, oh my goodness. Midlife crises go along with these things. <laughs> but I bought this book when I was young, 50 Years Among the Bees by Dr. Miller. So I got it out and read it again, and it just brought to my mind 150 years ago, the people were as smart or smarter than we are. This guy's beekeeping capabilities are beyond mine. And he made comb honey in the basswood sections, which are really hard to find anymore, but some of you may have seen them. And I made some of these in when I was young. It's difficult to get bees into these basswood sections. He made 10,000 a year. Oh. I try to make 4,000 honeycomb, and I do it on a big scale too. Usually fail and get 3,000. So these people 150 years ago, they weren't dumb. They just didn't have cell phones and all the things we have now. <laughs> so another great read, you won't learn a single thing, but if you want to know why you're obsessed with honeybees, <laughs> this is the book you want to get. The Joys of Beekeeping. And this book, basically, this man is able to explain 
how great he feels this day off of the beat. You're not going to learn anything other than, oh, that's why I'm obsessed with bees. I get it now. It's a great read. When you're depressed, I read this once a year. You got it, George? (laughs) (laughs) Some of the girls told me that you can still find this. I don't know where they found it, but it's available if you study it. I'll read it now. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, not at all. Not at all. Those are both good reads, in my opinion. We're on the Facebook and everybody looks at it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, 50 Years Amongst the Bees by C.C. Miller. I own a version of this, too. Awesome read for, for listening to that, reading how people used to do it in the 19th yeah. century. Yeah. And they were much more brilliant than we are today. Yeah, I, I kind of feel that way. Closer to me. Yep. Yes. Mm-hmm. Not, not distracted by all the right. albums. <laughs> so I don't just make comb honey. Uh, and I'll just give you opinions. This is not how maybe you want to run your hives or, or anything like that. But uh, I run a 150 hives maybe for extracted honey. I don't have a lot of time for all that. So this is how I know when to put a super. I winter my bees generally in two hive bodies in a shower. That's kind of the year-round scenario. Next week. The bee season's here, right? The lines are out. It's going to be warm. I lift up two high bodies. If the bees are using the lower one, find the super. Three, four extracting supers on right then and there. Now, these are grown combs from all my years of doing this. I think these are pretty attractive to draw and comb. And it really does help prevent swarming. And I don't have time to come back when they fill one and put, you know, they're getting three or four right at the same time. That's when I put the supers on, when they're using the lower high bar. Some bees don't winter so well. So I won't put a super on if they're not using the lower high body. The brood nest will kind of go up instead of them ever going down. Just what I do, not necessarily the right thing to do, but if you're unsure when to super, this has really worked for me. Wait till they're used in the lower high. Not jam packed. I don't even pull a frame out. I'll just look in and I can tell there's some brood, there's something going on. Do you have a question? So, so you don't reverse them? No. No. Every book tells you to do that. Reverse your high bodies. I did it for years. What I found was when you get that lower high body off the bottom board, the bees run out of patience. Right? Mm-hmm. That's when you get stuck. <laughs> so I decided, is this really necessary? So I'm going to do half of my operation without reversing high bodies. I did this 30 years, 40 years ago. In my opinion, that's a total waste of time. The bees are going to get down there. They're going to use that lower high body. Be patient. Get down there. Might break your back. Again. You do what you would like to do. <laughs> but I'm not reverting the high body on 200 high tech. It's just necessary, in, in my opinion. So, all right, that was a little bit about extracted honey. Another thing that I get a real kick out of, and you want to think about this over the years, is get one of your hives on some kind of a scale. Now, I'm an old mechanical person, so I have the platform scales where you slide the shapes. I have two going. And sometimes the hive on the scale didn't winter well, or you know, I want a good hive on the scale, so I got it better. Things that are really interesting is how mysterious a honey flow is and what you can learn from this scale. Remember in March, we had a day of 70 degrees? Well, maple trees bloom. Maple trees are inconspicuous, so you don't really think of them as blooming, or but they do. On that day, my scale high went at 13 pounds. Now, before I had a scale, a colleague of mine came by and told me that, I would go, um, when he left, I'm not sure about this. Get yourself a scale because it's really interesting. Another thing you learn 
you know, a hive of bees sometimes makes 200 pounds of honey. You know, we all do that. We all experience that. That comes in on 10 days out of the entire summer. Most days that scale does nothing. Honey blows are mysterious. Are you familiar with the honeysuckle bush, the invasive bush? Great honey plant. Great. When I first kept bees, that was an invert count. It's an invasive. And I got honey from tulip poplar trees. It's good honey, darker honey. But the honeysuckle bush, the bees prefer it. I don't get any of the tulip poplar honey anymore, even though they still give nectar, because if you stand under a big tulip tree in bloom, it'll drip on you. But the bees prefer honeysuckle. It must be a higher sugar content. Uh, that plant's going to bloom in one month. On certain days when that blooms, my scale goes up 20 pounds a day. The record I had was 30 one day. You know, it's hard to believe, but I got the scale and I slide the bar. <laughs> and then that hive makes me 200 pounds if I'm, I'm lucky, but it all happens on 10 days. Day after day, beautiful, sunny, and the scale don't do anything. I, I can't figure out what makes a honey flow. Very interesting. You have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were concerned. <laughs> but uh, when it first comes in, it's not uh, dehydrated. Does it get lighter as they feed? As they, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, when they evaporate the water off of it, yeah. it'll, it'll go down. And yeah. That's all nectar that's coming in. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing what honeybees can do. Honeysuckle's got a very high sugar concentration for a nectar source. So you lose about 50% of it compared to locust and things like that. Okay, so now we'll talk about what I thoroughly enjoy doing, and that's making honeycomb. So this is what I used to make before I became aware of the hog half comb system, the round sections. You're familiar with them. So I always tell the same story. Somebody went out of business and I bought a hundred supers, Ross Round supers. This is 30 years ago. I've never made a honeycomb in my life, but I had studied it. And I put these hundred supers out there properly manipulated and I got 3000 round sections. And they're in the honey house. And my wife said, what are you going to do with them? I really hadn't thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> so what rings in my ears is my wife always says, are you sure you know what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> I get a phone call. There's sometimes people are, somebody's looking out for you. I get a phone call. guy from Vancouver, and he says, I understand you make a lot of comb honey. How does this guy in Vancouver, you know, how does this happen? So I asked him, how do you know that? Well, I called the Ross Round Company, and Tom Ross told me you bought all these covers and labels. So somebody found me. But I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and I sold them the round sections for years. And one year he says, the girls have trouble putting this label on. But I send you the label and you put them on for me. He says, yeah, that's fine. So this, you got to read this label. This is from the alfalfa fields in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> <laughs> so Berks County in the Rocky. foothills of the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> <laughs> so over time, John Hall got a hold of me somehow. And he said, you ought to try to make my home money. I said, no, no, I'm heavily invested. I'm, I'm not, I can't do that. And he said, well, you, you need to consider it. He said, I'm going to send you one. So he sent me a honeycomb to eat. I just love it. The hog half comb has no foundation. This is called the cassette. The hexagon is embossed in the bottom of that. And I spray beeswax in here to help get the bees to get in there. But when he sent me the honeycomb and I ate it, it's like no wax here. 
There's no foundation. It's so delicate when you get a piece out on your bread that it just falls all apart. It, not that foundation is bad or all coal money is great, but I really like eating this. And I thought, this guy might have something here. So I started the conversion, make all of these, and Lo and behold, you know, he had a stroke and a lot of health problems, and, and he, he, he died. And I wanted to buy cassettes, so I call out to Michigan where I'm getting them, and, oh, John died, and, you know, there's some here, but that's it. The family has no interest. It's going to go away. And I said to my wife, I'm going to go buy that. He said, are you sure you know what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> so I bought it. I didn't make money for quite a few years, but it has been good to me late. Paul half himself, well, better be does a good job for me. And, and this is a nice wintertime project. I, beekeeping isn't lucrative, but I like doing it. So between selling honey and selling cassettes, I, I have a really good life right now. So, an up and coming thing, of course, I try to promote this to someone who wants to make 40 honeycomb, put it right on top of your hive. Uh, making honeycomb is challenging. I would be telling you the wrong thing to tell you you buy this, throw it on a hive, and you get 40 comb. Most of the time, you get a swarm. <laughs> <laughs> I have a split, it's on YouTube. It's a simplified Juniper Hill split, Dannenhauer split. I split about 50 colonies to make comb honey, and I'm very successful doing that. Uh, this is just an opinion. Of course, I want to sell this. I think everybody should have one of these when you catch a nice swarm. A nice swarm is very industrious. I throw it in one hive body and put this on. No excluder or nothing. And I get 40 nice comb out of this one. That's $400 for the swarm. Now, first of all, if I were a better beekeeper, the hive would not have swarmed. But... <laughs> so uh, there's a... my website has all kind of ideas on, on the hog half comb system. A new idea I have up and coming, and I was hoping to have it for this spring, but it isn't going to happen. I'm putting the Cassettes in a frame. So this is a tough sell to every beekeeper, right? This is a hundred and twenty dollar item. This item would make you eight honeycomb, and it'll be a thirty five dollar item. I think I could sell a lot of these to the one or two high beekeepers, but this is up and coming. This was a prototype. Uh, I put a hundred of these wooden frames together. And it was very successful. Just put it in the middle of your extracting super. And the last thing they're going to do is make you the eight comb. They're going to fill up all your drone comb first. But they do go in and they do make it eight nice comb. So hopefully we'll have these for next spring. And some of you may have an interest in that. Is that like set separately? Or is it we'll have to go through B2B? Oh, I'm going to sell at home. Better be whatever you care to do. This is another, do you sure you know what you're doing thing? <laughs> I couldn't get anybody to make these wooden frames. <laughs> and the people that did make them, they're crooked, the cassette didn't work. So I decided to get an objection molded frame. Everyone's going to be the same. $40,000 project. So you know what you're doing. I know. <laughs> 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 but when it is available, the cassettes are going to fit perfect. It's going to snap together. It, it's going to it's going to be a neat thing. Yeah. Whether or not I ever recover that money at this point in my life is a call. I think I will. I live long enough. So I guess that that will be my fifteen minutes. Did anybody have a question before? Uh, yes. So I'm brand new, and where do you put the scale? So you put your whole beehive on. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, I understand that as super, so you put it at the very bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Put the entire hive on, and never, it never comes off the scale. I have old platform scales. I understand if you're good with technology, you can buy things put under your hive, and you can read on your phone what's going on. I don't do technology. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I <clears throat> I put one of those on the, my hive last year, and uh, it it did fairly well, um, and and uh, I, but I only got like uh, maybe fifteen of them to really fill in. The outsides didn't get filled in, and uh, so I sold those fifteen, and I just that's all I eat now is the comb honey because it's and it's delicious. They're not all filled in, but I just kept them in the fridge and I. Pulled out and eat it all year long. What do I? What do you do with this? What do you do with the cassettes after you've eaten all the? Can is there some way I can wash it and put it back in or no? If you're gonna eat it yourself, you yeah, just rinse them out, stack them, tape them. I have tape. Beverly okay. has tape. Maybe so stack them together. Them. Yeah. Okay. You wouldn't want to sell something that you ate on, right? But for home use, I restack them. You restack them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No way to for clean them for resell no. use, right? Yes, that steam generator that was shown earlier will clean up. <laughs> melt the plastic pretty, what do you pretty do well. With the ones that didn't oh. only temperature. Oh. Well, I have a lot of failures. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. The ones that I the ones that I had that didn't fully fill, I you stuck do. them in my refrigerator and I pull them out every day and I eat them. That's all I eat, and so they're not <laughs> cast. But I just cut the. It's still honeycomb. It's just not cat and not beautiful yeah. and not sellable, right? What, what I do with the super that the bees did a poor job on is set it off in July. The bees will rob out all the honey. Oh. Take it home and save it. Nice clean place. It goes back on next year with some drawn comb in. Yeah. Really ups your chances. Yeah. Okay. So I definitely have failures, but I've never lost my investment. I, I get them to rob it. You don't want to put a comb honey super on and leave it on there until August, September. Mm -hmm. You either get honey during the main flow or you get it off. But they'll start propolizing later in the year. They propolize and, you know, just not, not a mess, but the cassettes don't look, don't look right. right. How much did you say that retails for the, the comb super? This is a 10 frame unit, is $120. Yeah. $120. Your costs are $2 for each cassette. There's 40 here, that makes $80. And the other 30 is the super, the follower boards, the springs. Now, once, once you have that super, you don't ever have to buy that again. Right, it's just the 80 bucks. You just buy the refill. Yeah. What do you sell your come honey for? I wholesale them for eleven dollars. Retail is it depends where you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah twenty dollars <laughs> for the dollar. How much weights uh, yeah. in uh, section? Well, this is a beautiful comb honey that weighs mm -hmm. a solid twelve ounces. Twelve ounces. But I weigh each one. The honey flows can stop. And the bees will cap them over thin. They won't weigh 12 ounces, so I sell 10 ounce comb and eight ounce comb. If it's capped and looks good, I sell them according to the weight. In a good year, I get a lot of 12 ounce comb, wholesale them for $11. My daughter takes them to New York and sells them for 25. Oh, <laughs> I can't do that where I live. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. You said yeah. you spray the cassettes with beeswax. How do you spray beeswax? John Hogg was a rocket scientist. He worked for NASA. The guy's brilliant. If you look at the way this interlocks, the, you may not like comb honey or have any interest in this, but if you study this thing, it's just genius how he put this together. He built a machine. It's the only one like it in the world. The wax them. It, it melts wax. It has tubes. Uh, I have two girls, neighbor girls, that help me. They wax 1,500 cassettes in three hours. <laughs> the machine is fast. They just take the cassette and push it down. 
it hits two toggle switches. One sprays the wax and the other one makes it go back. But it's just as fast as they can pick them up. How can a backyard pe person do something like that? Paintbrush. So when no, I buy a spray, it's all come. You spray. Oh, no, you spray. The, oh, you, spray. When you buy from me, there's wax spray on the top. Yeah, come spray. Come spray. After he explained that, I realized yeah. that it's coming that way. Now this <laughs> cassette, this cassette is not sprayed. It's just food grade plastic here. Now, but I sell them all with a coating of wax on it. Mm. Hmm. Better be sell them that way. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. I, they don't leave my place without wax on Got it. Got it. I wanted to sell overseas. And the issue is they won't allow beeswax in other countries. So I experimented producing hog half comb without wax on the bottom. It can be done. I had some success. It gives more burr comb, gives more trouble. I don't want to sell something that they're not going to be satisfied but my overseas sales are not happening unless I build a sprayer for someone. Over there. I don't know if I have time for the, all of that. <laughs> you say the two frame unit, the two frame unit will be available next year? I hope so. I'm already $20,000 into it. It was supposed to be available now. But, yeah. How can we find out when it's going to be available? Uh, website. Well, website, right? Website. I did bring some cards. If anybody wants a card, there's QR codes on this. None of I can't even read my own card. I don't even have <laughs> Young people do all this stuff for me, and it's very nice of them. But on the back of this card is the YouTube video on the split, and the front of the card I think just brings up the website. But if anybody wants a card, take it and keep in touch with me. Uh, Love to come down next spring, early with a bunch of frames and start to you know, get some of my money back. <laughs> I asked you an edgy question. This is on my way. What do you think about the new simple frame? That's pretty neat. Are you talking of one they stick in a wooden frame and yeah. you fold the cover over the yeah, back? Yeah, I saw it. A thin better. one. I saw it better be. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't have a coating of wax on it. Uh, I'm, I just think this is the greatest. That doesn't mean it is. I don't feel it's thin. Yeah. Versus it's a the flimsy thing. Uh, I didn't know if you saw it. I did see it. The Chinese knocked off the whole half pole. Hmm. Oh. everything. And better be bought a couple of these. Not everything made in China is junk. They had a bunch of good ideas on on their stuff there. That's where I got the spray mic. Are the cassettes recyclables of what number? Yeah, you know? yeah. The, there's a number on here, but I don't have my glasses on. I think it's a two. But there's numbers on here. Yep, you can recycle them. Yes. Can we pre-order the uh, ten frame the, the frames today? <laughs> the two frame. Yeah, the two oh, frame. You mean the new idea? Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to take your money. What if something happens to me? <laughs> <laughs> That's a risk. That's a risk. <laughs> just go for the ten frame. That's I think just it works. Ten frame. And you, and can, you, and you have eight frame as well, right? I'm not understanding what you're asking. He wants to throw money at you. I want to throw money at you to get your, what you think you're going to have next doing. year. I don't want that. You might be dead too next year. <laughs> <laughs> it's a race. <laughs> it's race. definitely going to have to have me come down next year. <laughs> well, well, where is the president? Get me on the schedule for March. <laughs> And, and we'll promote this frame idea. I'd love to come down. You buy one now. So the demo model that you have on the table, is that for sale today? <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're having. This one. 
Sale an auction style. Yeah, I'm not ready to auction it today. I'm going to pay you $80,000. Well, this one's crude, though. And that's okay. Wait. So, why? You're 20, 50. <laughs> the mold is going to make two size frames. There's a piece that comes in and out of the mold. This is for a shallow suit. Mm -hmm. But it's also going to have an extension for those people that use medium supers. And most people use a medium yes. super. Yes. When I was a young person, all we had was shallow supers, and they called these mediums of Illinois at the time. And an old friend of mine told me when I was 18, you're a fool if you get these medium supers. I didn't listen to him. My fingers are shot, you know, carpal tunnel, a hive makes a lot of honey, and here's this 50 pound super up here I can't get off anymore. He was dead right. Go to shallow supers. All you ladies here, you don't have to bother your husband to get the honey off. Shallow supers, just an opinion. But I have all these medium supers and I can barely lift them. But so there'll be two sizes frames available. <laughs> so the section that's on the bottom to get it to a medium, is that going to be for burr comb? Is it going to be a different size square section? It's comb? going to be hollowed solid plastic so the beans can't build comb there there won't be burr comb just a space taker just a space yeah. taker oh, and the frame is designed so the high beetles can't hide anywhere yeah. all the hollowing out will be on the inside when you put this in the bees will glue that seam right up and you won't have all these cavities for high beetles to hide so going back to the original question, is that for sale today? <laughs> How much would it take for that to be for sale? Today? I, it's 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 Ten bucks and it's yours. Ten bucks, there you go. Twenty. Ten. <laughs> we can raffle it, Herman. <laughs> we don't have covers along for it when you're successful, though. Of course, we can send them. Do you have your... 10 frames for sale or your eight frames yeah, for the, sale today? I brought a few of the units down for eight and 10 frames. Anybody has an interest. I also have a few honeycomb. If you never tried a hog half comb, I brought some down that have some little blemishes, but it's delicious honey. They're $10 a piece. Wow. Anybody wants a honeycomb? So what, uh, if we if we if we only had one of those, when do you, should we put it on to catch the honeysuckle? Yes, or yes, the, yes. Uh, black locust or yeah, they kind of bloom at the same time. Same time. May. Okay. Yeah, I'll, that, down here your honey flow is going to start real heavy in May first. I think so. It's ten days further. Or I get ten days further when cooks down. Yeah, that's really question. If if you're having trouble having the bees get up into that super, would it? Would you put another super like a, on top, uh, like a jumping super on top to draw them up? Or no. do you not need to do that? Like I said, it's not easy to do this. One way is do the split that is there. Another way is throw it on and just say a prayer. <laughs> I've never had success putting an extracting super above this. The bees will run right through that and draw all that out and not even touch that. Hmm. Honeybees are not attracted to any kind of foundation. You'll hmm. learn that as a beginning beekeeper. You know They are attracted to drawn comb, though. As the years go by, you extract and you accumulate drawn comb. Very beneficial. I have a feeling I went way past my time here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I Hi, thanks everyone for coming. I'm Monica and I am the chair for entertainment. And um, first of all, thank you all for coming. And I want to thank this club wow. as I'm coming into my third season. And George, Donna, I'm going to miss a ton of people. Tim, Ed, fabulous, fabulous. The things I have learned this year by volunteering more into the club is um, you get out what you put in. And I am on some outreach programs and we are doing amazing things. 
and reaching out to schools and Girl Scouts. And uh, I was blown away. I was blown away at everything that this club is doing. So we're doing a lot out there, but I'm going to try and bring all that love in here. And that's with the members. Okay. So with our members, um, we want to get to know each other better and more intimately and see what's going on. It doesn't matter if you have one hive or 101 hives, everybody has something to offer. And so the hive hop is, um, we had it a couple of years ago. There was some fail, but there was some awesomeness out of it also. And what we need is we need members to, we're going to send out a survey and we need members to say, I'd love for people to swing by and see my apiary and what's shaking out there. Cause everyone's going to be, Obviously different. And then we need the other part of the members saying, I want to see what's going on. So we have members participating in sharing their aviary and then members that want to go around and check all this out. You are not tethered to your home for the entire day. There will be a slot, a little window, and we're going to put that in the survey. Do you need a half an hour for your tour of your APR or do you need 45 minutes or an hour, whatever you want, but you're only going to be held captive to your home for that, that window. You can even jump in on the tour. And then when it's at your house, you're there coming with the rest of the people and, and sharing what it is that you have. So that's the hive hop. That's what it's all about. Seeing what other people are doing. And um, we're going to put out a couple of um, Saturdays and Sunday dates the last two weeks in May, maybe first week in June, we want to see what the majority of the people want to do and want to see because it's your club and we want it to just be super fun and get to know each other. Um, so that's the high pop. Does anybody have any questions about that? Everybody get it? It's like and a tour, club tour. Email right now. We're going to probably do it, um, what do you think? Sunday, Monday? This week. This week. This week. This week. This week. So You'll we'll see a that. survey. We need expecting answers, cutoff dates. Um, let's put that in there too. So a few of these questions. So yeah, we'll need because people need to know they want to get their gardens at their best, so they want to plan whatever it is that um, they want to showcase for their place. Um, so we'll have a, a start and an end date. We'll have um, majority rules. It's your club, so be participating in it. Yeah, if you don't want to do it, maybe reach out and say that. Maybe you know that people are paying attention and listening, like Mr. Cincinnati. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so um, that's it for the high pop, and we're going to um, get that survey out soon, and it's going to be fun, and we're going to have a um, collaboration at the end of it. We don't know where yet. It could be... I don't know if we're going to do a northern swing, the southern swing. It just um, depends on how much participation we have. But we're going to make it. There will be a party. Um, there will be a party. There's only a party. There's only a party. So, um, and then swinging into the summer picnic, um, I've reached out to East Goshen Park. And I don't know if you know where that is. Most of you, it's kind of centralized for the club. And, um, I reached out to them for the date and the time, and that is um, the second Saturday in July, and we have that party instead of a meeting, and um, we'll, we'll send out more information about that, but we do want to get that reserved. It's really going to be kid-friendly, family fun. Um, we can't have, like, the smoke. I, I've never been to a picnic with a club before, so I don't have a baseline, but... Um, we just want to encourage the little people, so grandchildren, your children, and we'll have fun games and shenanigans for sure. And then we'll have a party after that. <laughs> so, um, so that's what we're doing with that. I'll take this time to just say next next month we go outside. Uh, when I was asked to uh, find out if Cheslin was, we're going to go back to Cheslin. Um, when I was asked to find out if the space was still available. I found out there is a, um, I think it's called yeah. West West Branch Brewing. Has anybody ever heard of West Branch Brewing? Mm -hmm. They're going to be there at 2 o'clock. So I thought, hmm, how do we keep the beekeepers there from after the meeting until 2 <laughs> o'clock? And I thought, it would be really cool to go out and do like a native bee walk. Um, everybody seemed to really like, uh, who was it that gave the photography talk? 
Hillary. Hillary did a photography talk for our conference. That went over really well. I'm a photographer. If anybody wants to talk macro photography and go on a walk, we can do that as well. Maybe try to fill in the time. And then the West Branch Brewing has food and beer if anybody wants to stick around and make it a day. So we're going to get together and right. see if we can make it a day. And it's only four days out of the year because we only have four there. One of the outside ones is a picnic. But anyway, I just wanted to mention that. That's perfect. Uh, Charlie's going to talk to us about the Queen team. We uh, we did put an ask out for frames from for members. Uh, anybody that does have frames that are going to bring them out. We'll be out there after the meeting at the apiary. You need the address. It's 650 Brandywine Drive. It's listed in Westchester. Don't worry about it. It's listed in Westchester. <laughs> um, also, if you want to come out and help, particularly if you're, you're new beekeepers, there's going to be a lot of activity out there. We have to stock all the Meeting boxes. Um, there's a good opportunity to come out and see what's going on. Some of our members are already out there. Yes, they are. First. <laughs> Charlie, do the members that they come out need their bee equipment? Some of them may have not have bought it with us. Well, there's going to be bees, so yes. <laughs> but I mean, you can you can even come, you know, stand back and watch what's going on. If you just want to get an idea of what we're doing, it's it's a and even. We do a lot of other activities, which you can volunteer for and come out and, you know, gives you the opportunity to get into the hives, to find queens, to recognize what's going on with the hives, to be able to read the frames. So, all right. okay. any, any, any other questions as far as where we're at? Even if you have frames in the future, at least if we'll be in touch. If we still need frames, I don't know where we're going to be at the end of the day. There might be, if you go on the website, right, and look under the volunteering tab, the opportunities to, to get involved are going to start to open up a lot. Now that the bean season's here, that'd be with the queen team, that'd be with entertainment, that'd be with the community engagement, the speaking, all those opportunities are going to be underneath that tab. So I really, anyone who gives an hour, you don't, you can't even believe what the value of that hour is to the poor group of people that do most of the work. So please look at that. And if you can give an hour at some point, please, please do. It, it, it's very much appreciated. And the amount of work that's going to start to pile up over the next couple of months is going to be significant. So please check that tab. And it's as simple as clicking on it, signing up. It'll tell you what to do, what's going to be involved, where to go. Uh, we'll make sure you have the supplies necessary to do whatever you're signing up to do, but we really need people to, 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 to do that, okay? So thanks to Chris and thanks to Yasmin for volunteering. But, you know, they're big, big roles, but even an hour or two hours makes a big difference to us being able to, to do what we do. This is Mark. So I took over from Jack, who I see you standing in the back here. When, what year was it, Jack? You started being treasurer? 2014. So he's been doing this job since 2014. In my mind, he's one of the unsung heroes of this club. You would not believe all the work he did every day because it's more complicated than you can imagine. For example, whenever you go to the website and buy something, a transaction goes to the credit card, a company that validates the credit card, sends us an email that says, yes, it's a valid credit card. I'm still not sure I have all the strength. And then it goes to somebody else who then gives it to the bank. And each of those generates transactions that have to be looked at and recorded, et cetera. So and Jack also chair of the board last year. He seems to be the person we all go to for questions on the website and how to administer it. And he seems to have in his head all the history of the club in the recent years and stuff. So I'm well, really thank you. Well, he's gone through the years. So the club bought him that truck that you're showing? Yeah. <laughs> I think he bought well, that truck on his own. <laughs> so I'm still learning. And it's, as I said, Jack kept, when he was training me on this, kept saying, you sure you want to do this? <laughs> so um, I've lunched you the, the, the amount of money we have. 
And, and the highlight was the conference profit of almost $5,000. Um, we have the, a separate fund for Save the Bees. And as I said, it's a lot more complicated than, than I expected. And, uh, I'm trying to get a handle on it. It's actually very open to helping me out, which I obviously appreciate. So, uh, obviously, the books are open to any member. I have the computer with me if you want to see anything. 